introduce Patty Williamson. She's going to be doing our pro program tonight on Kangaroo Lake. Patty and her husband Howard grew up in a small town in northern Missouri where Walt Disney lived as a child. Residents of St. Louis since 1963, they bought their home at Kangaroo Lake 20 years ago today. They're here from April until Thanksgiving each year and would stay longer if it were not for the need for the time to spend with their two children, nine grandchildren and six great-grandchildren in Missouri, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Patty spent 27 years in public relations field and since her retirement in 1993 has written continuously as a freelance writer. In the past five years, she has written nearly 50 stories for the Peninsula Pulse and Door County Living Magazine. She is author of four books, including one of the 20-year history of American folklore theater and one of the history of Kangaroo Lake, the topic of her presentation tonight. So we welcome Patty, and we thank her very much for doing this for us, and I'm sure we will all enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am just so delighted to be here. Uh, this is our 21st summer on Kangaroo Lake. We found it almost by accident and now enjoy it eight months a year. I just can't imagine a better place to be. My opinion of Door County people was solidified in 1993. Uh, we had spent uh, the week between Christmas and New Year's here. And a few days later, uh, back in St. Louis, I got a call from Wisconsin Public Service, and the young lady said, uh, the meter reader is at your house, and he noticed that some electricity had been used, and he knew you'd been gone since summer, and he just wanted to be sure everything was all right. Uh, I said to Howard, do you think uh, Union Electric in St. Louis would have called and said, hey, you're... <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, Kangaroo Lake, as I'm sure you know, and I know there are many people in the audience that know more about it than I do. Uh, it's the largest inland lake in Door County. It covers 1,200 miles, or 1,200 acres. Uh, historians aren't sure how it got its name, but on the U.S. Surveyor General's 1836 map of this area, did you know they were mapping this area in 1836? Hmm. He identified it as Kangaroo, and he spelled it with a C not a K, perhaps because the draftsman thought, hey, that shape I just graphed sure looks like a kangaroo. I don't know how he could have figured that out without an aerial view, but he was right. The lake does look like a kangaroo, if you kind of squint. Uh, the correct spelling became permanent about 1900. When our neighbor, Will Anschutz, learned that I'm a writer, he suggested that I needed to do a history of the lake. That was in the summer of 1994. And we had spent only a few weeks here at that point, spread over three summers. I had just retired from a full-time job of 27 years. I was busy with a variety of freelance writing projects. I was not eager to handle, to start another major project. But Will, who of course is a lifelong resident of the area, was persistent. By the next summer, he had not forgotten about it. He had prepared a detailed list of people I needed to talk to and things I needed to ask him about. Uh, I'm very fond of Will, and I didn't want to disappoint him, so I said, okay, I'll talk to your father-in-law, and that was Jim Finley. You remember Jim Finley? Fam yeah, Uncle Jim Finley, famous for standing up in fishing boats. Uh, <laughs> he was 90 years old that summer, and by the end of the first interview with him, I was hooked. During the next two summers, I spent a lot of time taping memories of Jim and his twin sisters, Mary and Catherine Collins, who were our neighbors also. The lake, as it was at the beginning of the 20th century, came to life for me, and the oral history began to take written form. This photo shows Mary Finley left, who was Jim's mother, and uh, also the mother of the other six Finley kids. 
uh, a friend from Chicago who was Mary Jo Smith, Adelaide, Addie Collins Finley, Jim's wife and Mary Ellen Anschutz's mother, and Alice Finley Goss, the wife of Ed Goss on the right. As I continued with interviews and research, interesting facts accumulated. 5,000 years ago, Kangaroo Lake was part of Lake Michigan. When the, lake, the glaciers receded and melted, our lake was left several feet above the, layer, the level of Lake Michigan. The south winds created sand dunes, which are still visible around the southeast end of the lake. That kept the water from flowing back into Lake Michigan. You all know the story about Captain Bailey, the ship that uh, sought harbor from a storm and discovered rich resources of lumber and stone in the area. When we give our address to friends back in St. Louis, they say, oh, is there an apostrophe in Bailey's? I say, no, Bailey's Harbor is older than apostrophes. <laughs> <laughs> that is not quite true, but it was founded a long time ago. It was the first place in Door County selected for a village site. It was christened Gibraltar, but Bailey's Harbor was the name that stuck, and it was named as a county seat even before the county was actually organized. By 1852, when the lumber and quarrying business failed, all the workers left except for one, an educated fellow named Alan G. Powers. He made the first clearing on Kangaroo Lake. He lived there as a hermit for a long time. In 1857, he wrote a seven stanza poem about the lake that I found in Holland's 1917 History of Door County. 1857 was also the year the county seat was moved from Bailey's Harbor to Sturgeon Bay. And the way they voted on that, someone carried a cigar box around the county and collected votes from fishermen and farmers. Moses Kilgore was one of those who failed in the timber business he became a stage driver and was the first to push for the creation of a road from Bailey's Harbor to Sturgeon Bay. The route led through 10 miles of uninhabited forest and swamp. Think about going to Sturgeon Bay today and imagine it was all swamp and uninhabited forest. No tax money available, but Moses was determined. He got himself elected to the state legislature. He pushed through an appropriation and he personally supervised the construction of the road that is now Highway 57. During the first 50 years of its history, there was a greater mix of immigrants, Finns, Germans, Austrians, Poles, Danes, Scots, Irish, Englishmen, Swedes, Norwegian, Canadian, and Icelanders in Bailey's Harbor than anywhere else in Door County. There were distinct settlements for the Austrians, the Poles, the Germans, and the Irish. The latter sat settled as farmers near Kangaroo Lake. Well, I do immediately when I heard that. That's why I feel so at home there. Love those Irish. Before the construction of the dam at the south end of the lake in the 1930s, Kangaroo Lake drained into Hines Creek, which was then a sizable, and according to the Marine Department, it was sometimes a navigable waterway. Hard to imagine that today. This photo from a booklet produced by the Bailey's Harbor Country Club, wherever that was, <laughs> depicts Kangaroo Lake Creek, but today it's called Hines Creek. Not everyone was happy when the dam raised the level of Kangaroo Lake. Mr. Candioto reported that his cranberry marsh was inundated, and that was a problem because the family had depended on the cranberry crop to trade in town for staples like flour and sugar and coffee. And you'll hear more about the Candioto family later. Two of the largest Indian villages in Wisconsin were once located at the mouth of Hines Creek and the nearby Hibbert Creek. This was especially interesting to us as my husband, who loves to read history, has a favorite series of books about the Michigan Indians, not Michigan, but Michigan. And they moved to the southwest from the shores of Lake Michigan. Some longtime lake residents, and maybe some of you here, remember picking up arrowheads and other relics as children. And the Schoff brothers, Bob and Walter, recall being afraid of the reclusive Sam Carty, whom they thought was the last Indian in the area. More likely, I'm told it was Sam's mother who was the last remaining full-blooded Indian. Sam was probably harmless, but Walter, who passed away just a few days ago, and Bob always changed to the other side of the road when they saw Sam coming. You're all familiar with the causeway that carries Highway E across the lake. Joe Zock told Pat Tischler that during the mid-1860s, long before the causeway was built, there was a crossing at the north end 
of the lake. It began at Highway E in Maple and connected with Summit Road leading into Bailey's Harbor. At that time, the lake was very low because there was no dam at the south end. Water was only ankle deep over a gravel bar that could support a horse and wagon. The original causeway was built in the late 1880s by piling cedar logs the width of the road up from the lake bottom, covering the top with stone and gravel. This photo, which is also the one on the front of the book, uh, was taken about 1909. For obvious reasons, all those logs, it was known as a corduroy road. It must have been a lot of fun in those wagons. One source estimates that nearly 5 million feet of logs was used in its construction. A rustic log fence lined each side of the one-way bridge. Those wishing to cross had to holler to the other end to make sure no one was headed toward them. <laughs> At night, it was wise to have someone walk ahead with a lantern. <laughs> Gusty Erickson provided this photo of a car that took an unfortunate wrong turn off the causeway in the early 1930s. Ice cutting used to be a big business on the lake in the winter. Behind the dunes on the western shore is an old trail hacked out before the 1920s so that sleds could pull ice cuttings from the lake. The ice had to be no more than 20 inches thick so that this machine built by Oswald Combs could cut through it. Ice from near the causeway was especially prized. Workers were paid $2 a day. The ice cakes were sold for four cents to Otto Vake's Grocery, to Miss Emma Toff's Resort on Toff's Point, and to Washachek's store, now the site of PC Junction on Highways E and A. A steel boat ramp at the public boat launch on the east side of the lake was installed in the late 1960s by Lauren Pyle, Mickey Stark, Ray Hotz, Will Anschutz, Dave Anschutz, Doc Hall, and Tony Turk. Turk at that time was president of the Kangaroo Lake Association and the owner of Steel Fabricating, Inc., which made the ramp. He donated it to the lake. When a replacement was needed later, the town and county cooperated to bring a prefab ramp that had earlier been at Cana Island. Turk's ramp was moved to Happy Landing Resort. These volunteers are completing the installation of 25 fish cribs in the lake in February 1967. Shown from left are the late Harold Gauger and Bob Canton, 12-year-old Jim Anschutz, Brother Andrew of St. Joseph's Novitiate, Lauren Pyle, and the late Wilbur Hack. Uh, the Lake Association also placed a number of fish cribs, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago, probably. In 1880, Ann Griffin sold one half acre of her land on the northeast corner of E and Loggerquist to the Board of School District Number 2 in Bailey's Harbor for the purpose of building a school. The price for that half acre of land was $15. Among the students was Will Anschutz's mother, Hattie Peterson, along with her siblings, Ella, Hans, Oscar, and Harvey. Others who attended included children from these families, the Girdmans, who lived where the Coyote Roadhouse is now, the Krishkas, who lived on the farm just west of the school, the Krauseys, who lived south of the school at the intersection of E and Maple, the Burgers, who lived on Burger Road, the Collins, Steffens, Krauseys, and Mannies, who lived on or just off Loggerquist, and the Kapiskis, who lived on Beach Road. The school was in operation until 1907, when the district sold the property to Hugh Collins for $35. In the early 20s, the little school building was moved to the Collins Farm, which later belonged to P.R. O'Brien, chairman of the Chicago Board of Trade. And it's still there across Loggerquist Road from the former St. Joseph's Retreat Center. The outside has been improved and the inside restored to the appearance of a 19th century country school. This part of the old O'Brien Farm has been sold. I hope they maintain it to keep uh, preserving that part of Door County history. Students who completed eighth grade in the county schools had to go into Sturgeon Bay to take their final exams until the school in Fish Creek was built in 1920. Those from Kangaroo Lake who wanted to attend high school went to Gibraltar after 1920. When roads made travel difficult in the winter, they boarded with Fish Creek families or some of them skied to school. In 1926, Allender and Raymond O'Brien bought Lester Manny's farm on the west side of Kangaroo Lake. 
Later, during the Depression, they also purchased Hugh Collins' farm from his widow. These two properties, totaling 400 acres with about a half mile of lakefront, became Waseda Farm. For one seven-year period in their lives, it was the O'Brien's year-round home. Raymond, who had served as president of the Chicago Board of Trade, was a devout Catholic who never missed early morning mass. On one occasion, while he was staying at the lake, a blizzard left drifts more than five feet deep. Undaunted, he made his way to the barn, put chains on the tractor, and spent five hours driving to church in Bailey's Harbor. The priest, knowing Raymond would be there eventually, had delayed the service until he arrived. <laughs> After Raymond's death on New Year's Eve 1953, Eleanor gave the property to the priests of the Sacred Heart and the first residents, the Reverend Bernard Zwicky, Brother Clement and Brother Andrew, arrived in 1961. The huge old dairy barn was remodeled into a Swiss chalet type structure that, along with the newly constructed building, was established the St. Joseph's Novitiate in 1964. It was hoped there might eventually be as many as 60 young men in attendance, but over its eight years of operation, only 32 were enrolled. Now the retreat center is no more. A program for young people has used the facility the past few summers. If you happen to live within a mile or so of the lake last weekend, you heard them <laughs> celebrating with music. In fact, we were at uh, Door Shakespeare on Friday night and could hear the music over there. This is Brother Andrew and Father Zwicky in the early days of the novitiate. All these facts were interesting, but it was the personal stories people told that were most fascinating to me. The late Pat Tischler provided many of the stories in the book. William Tischler, Pat's father, died when Pat was 18 leaving a signed contract to build a house for a spinster who owned property on the lake. She said that, that Pat was obligated to honor that contract. Although he'd sometimes worked with his father, he told her he'd never build a house. And she said, well, it's a good time to start. <laughs> <laughs> that house was the first of more than 50 Pat built around the lake. From 1942 until 1985, 43 years he built. He had photos of every house and stories about the families who lived in them. For example, he remembered that the early residents of Eggers Point, across from the Coyote, uh, were from uh, St. Louis, mainly doctors. This is an aerial view of the point showing many of the original cottages. Uh, the families from St. Louis who lived on the point would gather on Sunday evenings to share their leftovers from the week in an outdoor dinner. Each family brought its hired girl to help serve the meal. The foods might be leftovers, but the dress was not informal. The picture shows the hired girls in white caps and aprons, the women in long white dresses, the men in the three-piece suits. They also wore fishing. Everyone went out formally dressed to fish. Barbara Collenberg Walsh provided most of the Eggers Point history. Doctors Gus and Florence Eggers, who practiced in Sturgeon Bay, built the first log cottage at the northwest corner of Kangaroo Lake in 1924. A second building held the kitchen and the dining room. It was common in those days for the kitchen to be separate so that the main house could be saved in case of fire. A third building housed the garage and the maid's quarters. This is Florence and Gus Eggers in the summer of 1926. Their kitchen dining room is at the left and the main house at the right. It wasn't long before four more cottages were built and the area became known as Eggers Point. The floor plans were different, but they all had the same distinctive vertical split cedar log siding, the same windows, doors, shutters, and hardware. Each cottage was identified by different color trim, red, light green, orange, blue, and dark green. During the early summers from about 1927 to World War II, this small community came together to relax and enjoy the lake breeze. Families from St. Louis arrived in June. The husbands then went home, but returned to Door County to spend the month of August. If you were awake at 5.30 a.m., you could hear some of the men taking off for a morning of fishing in their vested suits and wearing their straw hats. The ladies in long dresses would gather under shade trees to visit over their needlework. Off in the distance, young Oswald Combs from Bailey's Harbor could be seen mowing the grass. His job was to cut the five lawns regularly with a push mower. For those who enjoyed tennis, it was close at hand on a court built in the backyard of the present Smith Cottage. 
There was a common well that provided drinking water. Each cottage had an intake pipe to the lake during the summer to provide other water needs. Uncle Jim Finley remembered his first trip to the lake in 1915 when he was 11 years old. He and his father came up by train from Chicago and were met in Sturgeon Bay in a 1914 Ford Touring car. By 1917, Charlie Panter, owner of the popular Panter's Hotel, had acquired vehicles to meet the trains in Sturgeon Bay and bring tourists to Door County. A booklet promoting Door County boasted, Door County is the pioneer Good Roads County in the state of Wisconsin. There are 125 miles of perfect water-bound macadamized roads, which is more than any other three counties put together. And these all, roads all lead directly to Bailey's Harbor. Speaking of old cars, I love this picture that I found in the library. The contributor noted that drivers often kept a bucket of rocks beside them to throw at annoying dogs. <laughs> in the early days of the tourist industry in Door County, the road from Milwaukee to Sturgeon Bay was gravel. The maximum speed was 35 miles an hour, and the trip from Chicago took at least 14 hours. If there were many flat tires to patch, and there usually were, the journey took two days. In the early days, the road from Bailey's Harbor to Sturgeon Bay was so bad that even in the summer, when someone made the trip by auto, it was significant enough to be mentioned in the advocate. <laughs> the Finleys, on that first trip in 1915, stayed at Kangaroo Lake Lodge, also called Evergreen Camp. It was the first business establishment on the lake, owned by Mag Wilson, whose husband was captain of one of the Goodrich Line steamships. Frank Kellogg, a next-door neighbor of Jim's grandfather in Chicago, spent his summers in Door County and had a wife from Ireland. They had no children, so she asked Jim's mother if he could go to Door County with them in 1916. He would be 12 by now. They got a stateroom on a steamship to Sturgeon Bay. Jim told his mother it was just wonderful, but they made him use a knife and fork to eat his fish. <laughs> I don't know what the Finleys did at home. In 1919, Jim Finley's dad brought from the grandfather of our neighbor, Tom Goss, five 100-foot shoreline lots on the east side of the lake, including the land where our home is. The price was two fifty a lakefront foot, $2.50. Their first cabin was built in 1920, much extended. It's now our next-door neighbor, 7497 South Kangaroo Lake Drive. There was just one entrance to the lots of Finley's owned, a 16-foot-wide alley fenced on both sides that ran from the lake to the Collins Farm on Highway 57, where the wood shop is now. The sellers of the lots had a mortgage on the property, and Jim's dad said he would not pay it until they gave him additional property for a road to access all the lots. The road wasn't blacktopped until years later, when Alice Finley Goss gave up title to the road in exchange for its being paved. This road, which is now South Kangaroo Lake Drive, originally ran clear through the woods to County E. However, when it was improved, the McArdle sisters traded a parcel of their land with the county, so the road would turn back up the hill to Highway 57, jogging around their property. Remnants of the old trail to County E are still visible in spots, but growing dimmer every year. Jim recalled with glee the time some male guests from Chicago, after a night in a tavern in Bailey's Harbor, now the Harbor Fish Market and Grill, thought it would be really fun to borrow the tavern stuffed bear and set it up near the woman's outhouse at Evergreen Camp. <laughs> a group of school teachers from Chicago went out after dark. The light from their lanterns showed off the glass eyes of the bear and the terrified ladies tore back up the past screaming, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, let me make it to the door. There's a bear in the outhouse. <laughs> Can't you just hear Jim Finley telling that story? Jim Finley's sisters, Mary and Catherine Collins, remember being picked up in a rowboat when they were teenagers to pick cherries at the Messer Orchards on the west side of the lake. They earned 25 cents a pail and usually quit after they'd earned enough to buy their new fall hats. Mary said, oh, we just did it for fun. That's where all the boys were. <laughs> Nearly all Door County kids picked cherries then, along with many Indians, seasonal workers who slept in the farmer's barns. Later, during the Depression years, the pay fell as low as seven cents a bucket. 
an industrious fellow might fill up to 20 buckets a day and was mighty glad to earn a dollar and 40 cents for eight to 10 hours work. Of course, bread was a nickel then and eggs were 10 cents a dozen. Mag Wilson's Lodge has had several owners through the years. The late Hope Butler Pearson's parents brought it from Mag in 1919 and renamed it the Kangaroo Lake Hotel. This photo of Hope and her husband, Wally, was taken at their home in California when they were in their 90s. Barbara Barbieri loaned this postcard of Balsam Cottage at Kangaroo Lake Hotel, mailed in 1930 for a penny. The message from Clara P. reads, arrived in time for dinner, rode to Cana Isle Lighthouse and climbed to the top, fish today, caught one pike. At age 95, Hope still remembered the time a fire started in an underground peat bog near the hotel and continued to burn for a year or two. Until I heard that story, I never realized there was a peat bog in Door County. Those early Irish residents must have brought it with them. <laughs> Among the wealthy guests at the Kangaroo Lake Hotel was the Simmons family from Chicago who owned the Simmons Mattress Company. Mr. Simmons was a fine drummer and always got a band together to participate in the Friday night talent shows. Hope shared many, many stories, including the fact that her curiosity often got her in trouble, wanting to know if it was true that if she stuck her tongue on a piece of metal on a freezing day, her tongue would stick to the metal. She tried it out on the post of the windmill, and she found out it was true. <laughs> her friends finally pried her loose, but not without leaving skin on the post. To add insult to injury, she couldn't eat dinner that night, and dessert was blueberry pie, her favorite thing. <laughs> Hope recalled that her mother was a wonderful seamstress and made costumes for all the girls in a play during her freshman year in high school in Gibraltar. As I twirled across the stage in my hoop skirt, Hope said, it got caught on the knob of a drawer in the kitchen table, pulling it out and spilling silverware all over the stage. I was terribly embarrassed, but the audience thought, it, audience thought it was a part of the play. My cousin Lois paid the part of a drunk and received many compliments on her performance, but she, she wasn't awarded the prize for best actress because politics entered the judging. The daughter of the mayor won. <laughs> Lois's mother was aghast anyway to think her daughter would play such a role and that the school would allow it. Hope also recalled that Halloween was an exciting time in Bailey's Harbor. I remember, she said, when some older boys took the trailer belonging to the town drunk and parked it in front of the saloon. I don't remember whether he was in the saloon or the trailer at the time. <laughs> the butlers lost the hotel through foreclosure during the Depression. The next owners were the McArdle family. The late Catherine McArdle recalled that many guests would come into the harbor on the Goodrich line, then hire a horse and buggy to take them to the lodge. The McArdles were relatives of Mike McArdle, who built Maxwell and Bray's golf course. The photo was provided by Gusty Erickson. She thinks the gentleman shown her Mr. Valentine, Mr. Armato, and Mr. Pruder. Mike McArdle's nieces, the late Catherine and Jeanette, sold the hotel in 1977 to Pat and Arps Horvath, who continued to operate it as Kangaroo Lake Resort. In the 1800s, before the Gosses or the Finleys owned the property, the first Catholic church service in the area was held on what's now our side yard. That would have been part of the Goss property, of course, and still is. Dorothy Walshlager's grandparents, Frank and Dora Tosland, moved to Kangaroo Lake about 1915. They lived in a small log cabin on the property until their house was completed. One of Dora's requests was that she moved way out there from downtown Bailey's Harbor she must have her own transportation. So her husband got her a horse and buggy. Later, she was one of the first women in Bailey's Harbor to drive a car as soon as the Model T's came out. The Toslands had one son, Guy, who was Dorothy's father. The photo shows Frank and Dora with little Guy. They lived on the lake until they sold the farm to Alan and Gusty Erickson in 1941. This shot of the Erickson farm appeared in the Advocate on January 5, 1950. The Ericksons collected night crawlers in the yard after a rain, kept them in a dirt-filled tank in the basement. They sold them for 18 cents a dozen to dealers. Individuals had to pay 25 cents a dozen. Gusty remembered that sparks from the steam engine of the threshing machine started a fire on the chicken house roof in 1961. 
The threshing crew was eating dinner inside, but Al Armato and his sister were sitting out on the steps and saw the fire. The Ericsons didn't have a telephone, so the Armados ran home to call the fire department. But by the time the fire engine arrived, men had used pails and kettles to throw water on the fire and nearly had it out. This is the late Gusty and Alan Erickson. The Goss family has been on Kangaroo Lake since 1875 when Tom Goss and his wife Margaret moved from Madison and purchased 2,000 feet on the east side of the lake. Tom's father Michael was born in Ireland in 1799 and died in Bailey's Harbor in 1904 at the age of 105. Tom's oldest son, Edward, married Alice Finley in 1933. Six of their seven children, Charles, Tom, Mary Goss de Mayo, Mike, Dick, and Tim, now own homes on land they inherited. The seventh, Jill Goss Doyle, owns a plot of land from the original farm. Bill Yakumson, the son of Heidi and the grandson of George Messer, who owned the Kangaroo Lake Orchards, spent most of his growing up summers with the Messers. He remembers going to Barney Hoford's ice house north of Bailey's Harbor every day for ice to keep the water for cherry pickers cold. And he remembers the stories of local characters. Carl Pruder's famous hole in one at Max Belt and Bray's, the Carmody brothers picking up cans and bottles along Highway 57, the slot machines at the rendezvous, the 19th hole at the golf course. Our father and Grandpa George used to hire boats out of Egg Harbor when the perch were running, Bill says. I remember a captain by the name of Miles Leroy, who used to be a guide. As I recall, they found him drowned one day, apparently having fallen out of the boat that was still circling around him. Most of all, though, I remember Plex vanilla ice cream. No one has ever come close to having vanilla ice cream with as much flavor. For many years, Bill and his twin brother Peter tootled around the lake in a flat-bottomed speedboat, powered by a Johnson 16-horse outboard. It wasn't until the Schoaf brothers came in with an honest-to-God big boat and motor that we knew we were out of the competition, he said. Will Anschutz, who grew up to marry Jim Finley's daughter, was born on a dairy farm on the corner of E and A, now the site of Stone's Throw Winery. He recalled that his dad's hired men used to walk to Kangaroo Lake with yokes on their shoulders, holding buckets to bring back water for the cattle. Farmers who lived closer to the lake just brought their cows and horses down to the lake to drink. When Will was a young teenager, he bought a used bicycle from Hank Meyer, his neighbor to the west. That gave him the opportunity to travel, mostly to school, to the homes of friends a mile or so away. During the summer months, he made a daily evening trip to the West Kangaroo Lake Beach. There, he says, it was a case of, move over, cows, I'm coming in. <laughs> On the back of this picture, someone wrote, here's the best thing Wilmer owns. I have a feeling that was written by Will's future wife, Jim Finley's daughter, Mary Ellen, because he used the bicycle to go courting. By the time Will was 15, downtown Bailey's Harbor had become a regular Sunday afternoon trip. First a baseball game, where the Associated Bank was later built, then a hamburger from Bob Herb's stand near the tavern, and ice cream from Angie Schramm's parlor next to Wasserbach's Hall, where movies were shown in the evening. It was one of those places where he met Mary Ellen Finley, who rode side saddle on his back for the next two years and became his wife in 1954. This is Mary Ellen and Will in front of their honeymoon cottage on their first anniversary, March 27, 1955. Will was home on leave from Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. He told us that was not the state of Missouri, it was the state of misery as far as he was concerned. <laughs> Exactly two months later, on his last day of basic training, he received word that his son Jim had been born. Here's Charles Finley getting acquainted with his first great-grandson, Jim Anschutz. Sometime before 1920, Will's grandfather had been a day too late with his offer to buy Echo Island in the lake for $800. The island was uninhabited until 1923 when it was purchased from Charles and Elizabeth Henschel for $1,500 by Olaf, Carl, and Oscar Stromberg, brothers from Sweden who owned a car dealership in Chicago. The Henschels had bought it eight years earlier from the Gerdman family. Here are two of the Stromberg brothers in a photo taken before they left Sweden. The island was logged and the lumber used to build the big house, the two-story boathouse, a separate kitchen and dining room, and a wood shop. This is the boathouse in the 1940s, and this is the big house. 
the well was drilled in the winter because that was the only time they could bring the equipment over the frozen lake. It remained in their family for 71 years. The late Vesta Stromberg married a son in the family. Here's Vesta and her twin sister Vera on their first visit to Echo Island in 1947. Their family was visiting Oscar Stromberg, their dad's employer. Little did Vesta know that many years later she would marry Oscar's son, Ralph. Miriam Millenius, the daughter of the late Ethel Stromberg Millenius, shared memories of her summers on the island. The brothers enjoyed the island together for several years, but as their families grew, they divided the summer into three-week segments. The three weeks were rotated, so some summers the family would open the island and other summers they would close. During the 1950s, Olaf drew up plans to subdivide the island, including a road to be built from the closest point on the eastern shore. The plan never got off paper. They had no telephone on the island. To place a phone call home to Chicago, they came into Bo Bailey's Harbor, where a home on the side of the former Remax office housed the switchboard. The operator placed the call, then they went across the street to a phone booth to talk. There was no electricity on the island until 1946 when a high tension wire was strung from Beach Road on the west side of the lake to a pole on the island. A cable was laid in the lake in the 1970s. Bill and Ethel Stromberg Millenius on the island in the early 40s. Ethel was Vesta Stromberg's sister-in-law. The big house had been vacant for nearly 30 years when the island was sold in 1994 to Bill Anderson, who held his wedding reception there. He restored the buildings using materials from a home his grandfather, Vice President Marshall Fields in Chicago, built on Eggers Point in 1949. Fifty years after Vesta and Vera's first visit to the island, Bill Anderson caught the sisters in the same pose. In 1959, Pat Tischler built a summer cottage on the west side of the lake for Ralph and Vesta. In 1967, Ralph decided to start a summer business with a 44-foot pontoon boat. Do you remember the Kangaroo Queen? It seated 40 passengers, Ralph fried chicken for box lunches, the guests enjoyed on hour-long rides around the lake. Some of our neighbors that have been there a long time said, oh, yes, they had music and they danced on that boat. And we'd all go down to the docks and wave at them when they came by. Vesta said, nobody danced on our boat. <laughs> <laughs> Here are the Stromberg's daughters, Karen and Kim, with the sign that directed members of the Kangaroo Lake Association to the group's annual picnic in 1969. Dorothy Merriman shared many wonderful memories of the house she, her husband Bob, and his father built on Elm Point Road soon after Bob returned from service in the Pacific during World War II. Here Bob is on the roof of their first little cabin, nearing completion in 1947. It later became their bunkhouse. The fireplace Bob built included a swinging arm for a big iron pancake griddle. Dorothy cooked all the family's meals on it for a long time. It easily held a dozen eggs or a pound of bacon, and she found that a pitchfork was just perfect for toasting three slices of bread. <laughs> you do what you have to do. Dick and Laverne Pawlowski were induced to Kangaroo Lake in 1963 when their friends, True and Marion Adams, invited the Pawlowskis and their four children to spend their two-week vacation in the cabin owned by the Adams and their five children. Now this was a four-room, semi-finished cabin named Close As We Could Get because it was across the road from the water. It was a cozy fit for 13 people. <laughs> but they shared vacations until 1971 when the Pops bought that cabin and the Adams built an A-frame across the road. The Pops' daughter Lynn posed as a mermaid on the Kangaroo Lake Association float that took first place in Bailey's Harbor's July 4th parade in 1969. Kruger's on Kangaroo, where the Coyote Roadhouse is now, was an early gathering place on the lake, frequented mostly by men. Mary Ellen Kruger Kredge remembers that it must have been about 1940 when her family visited the lake and her father fell in love with an old deserted farm at the west end of the causeway. Before we knew it, she said, it was Kruger's on Kangaroo. With the help of some local people, cottages were built, the original farmhouse and little shed were restored and made into additional rental cottages. The main building, which became the office, snack bar, and soda fountain, 
was purchased and moved from Peninsula State Park. It had been a bar in the park, but it had four bedrooms and a bath upstairs, which the Krugers used as living quarters. The favorite item on the menu was a kangaroo burger. A friend of Mary Ellen's made their sign, which said, try our kangaroo burger. It will make you jump for joy. <laughs> this is Ernest Malberg, Paul Malberg's uncle, displaying his catch in front of Kruger's. The name of the place became Michelson's on Kangaroo Lake when the restaurant was sold to Blodwin and Harry Michelson in the mid-60s. This picture was taken in 1966. The Malberg family has been associated with Kangaroo Lake for generations. Paul's grandfather worked in the timber trade around the lake in the mid to late 1800s. His parents and their close friends, the Shofs, began camping on the Messer property on the southeast shore in the 1920s and purchased land there in 1928. Light came from a kerosene lamp. Food was kept cool in a concrete box built into the ground. Mr. Messer kept lake ice stored in sawdust and after the Malbergs acquired an ice box, it was Paul's job to boat over to Messer's and buy a block of ice. His mother used their kerosene and wood stoves to can fruits and vegetables from local farmers as well as fish. This can't fish sound good? I don't think so. This is teenage Paul looking south from the dock of the family cottage on the east side of the lake. And this is his sister, three-year-old Evelyn Malberg Seifert, standing on the live fish box. This impressive string of fish was caught by the parents of Bob and Walter Schoff and their sister Marion Schoff Bezold. The Schoff's first structure was put up in a weekend in the early 1920s and christened the shack. It's still used today by their sister, Marion, whose late husband referred to it as that old wooden tent. <laughs> this photo shows bathing beauties, aunts, uncles, cousins, and the show family. It was taken in front of that wooden tent about 1921. And here are the show boys, Walter in the center, who, as I said, passed away a few days ago, Bob on the right, and their cousin, Robert Perillon, during one of their early summers at the lake. The Schoff boys made daily trips across the Nalf Alpha field and over a rail fence to bring pails of drinking water from Messers and to Toseland's Guernsey Farm for a gallon of milk. Sometimes they went to the Heinz Farm across Highway 57 for Holstein milk, but their mom preferred the cream from the richer Guernsey cows. The kids also spent an hour a day picking rocks for the apple orchard. <laughs> their dad had planted. For entertainment, they had an RCA Victrola that had to be cranked almost constantly. Dave Jarevitz remembers the space for a road to his family's cottage was cleared in 1949. This is on the west side of the lake with a pick and shovel. That's not so long ago. Think of clearing a road with a pick and shovel. He has memories of their fancy two-seater house house, speaking of not so long ago. The holes were different sizes to accommodate adults and children. <laughs> Cherovitz also remembers that in the late 1960s, his dad was able to buy the lot south of their cottage from a Mr. Polson, who was the chief of police in Milwaukee. Polson had originally planned to build a guest cottage on that property, but he later decided he didn't want that much company anyway. <laughs> George Messer, who owned the orchards on the west side of the lake, also owned lakefront property on the east side that he sold to the Charlie and Lou Miller family from the south side of Chicago, who built East Shorewood Cottages. Many of the people who contributed stories to the kangaroo history spent their first Door County vacation at East Shorewood and later bought summer homes on the lake. In the beginning, the cottages were furnished with oil lamps, a kerosene cooking stove, a wood heating stove, pails for well and lake water, and bedding. A boat was also included in the rental price, starting at seventeen fifty a week. The better cabins cost forty seven fifty a week. Dodie Miller Doyle was a young girl in nineteen twenty five when her family first came to the lake and built East Shorewood. She provided lots of memories and photos, including this cartoon that was published in a newspaper in nineteen eighty six. Dodie recalls rides at Tin Lizzie's, amateur productions at Schramm's Hall and Bailey's Harbor, and all the times Ted Wold, Horse Apple, and Hans Pyle just happened to drop in at the Wilson cabin at mealtime and put on aprons afterward to do the dishes. 
She remembers riding her bicycle to the Bailey's post office during the gas shortage in 1933. As sure as she was happy to do as it gave her a chance to check out the caddies at Maxwell and Bray's. In this 1935 photo, Dodie is second from the left with Cassie Wilson, Rita Wilson, and Ollie Miller. Uh, Ollie was Dodie's sister. She remembers lots of good times at Bailey's Harbor teen hangouts, Wasserbacks, and Panthers. She also recalled places she did not visit. Bailey's Harbor, with a population of 600, had seven saloons. Dodie was my best customer for the first edition of the Kangaroo Lake History Book. She bought 14 copies. Since 1988, the cottages, like most of the former resorts on the lake, have been privately owned. Ruth Law shared this 1957 postcard of the beach at East Shorewood. Ruth and her husband, Robert, purchased the resort in 1970. Another popular resort on the lake was Birchwood Cottages, owned by the Valentine family from 1916 to 1967. This old postcard shows the Birchwood grounds. This is Lyndon Valentine and his wife, Gertie, whom he also called Dolly. And here is Lyndon's Model T in front of one of the Birchwood Cottages. After Gertrude Valentine died in 1967, the property was sold to John Perkrifke, who changed the name to Vista Villages, Villas. Their brochure stressed that the cottages had electricity and indoor plumbing. Pokrifke lasted just two years in the business, selling in 1969 to June and Charles Esau. Their first improvement was installing a shower in each cottage, eliminating the community shower house that had been in use for more than 50 years. Anne Lepowski Glennon had spent most summers on the lake since the 1940s staying at the home of her grandparents, Bill and Jenny Armato. This is Ann with her parents, Sig and Ann Armato. She remembers the day that Fern Erickson took her and her sister Peggy on an adventure down a gravel path overhung with large trees. It's now First Lane. They also made frequent trips to Pile Inn for humdinger milkshakes. Today, Ann and her husband, Glenn, have a home on the west side of the lake, but they sold that just last month. I enjoyed learning about all the 116 families who contributed information to the book, but my favorite was the vast, extended Faust Candy Odo clan. Many family members contributed to a book assembled for a 2003 reunion, and I drew many wonderful stories from it. They have one of the longest and best documented histories on the lake. Carol Ann Thielen Schmidt is the fourth generation to live at the farm on Summit Road. The family has owned this property since 1882. Six generations have occupied the home in the past 130 years. I believe I saw on the uh, float in the parade, it's now seven generations. Oh, and I might add, when I was introduced, they said we have six great-grandchildren. I was hoping I could change that tonight. Number seven was due Sunday and number eight was due Monday, but they're not here. <laughs> Uh, when Elizabeth and Conrad Fast bought the farm, there was an old log cabin with a kitchen, bedroom, and milk room on the first floor, three bedrooms, and a cistern for rainwater upstairs. Conrad, believed to be of minor nobility, returned to Germany to receive an inheritance, a trip that took nearly a year. When he returned, he brought wonderful gifts for everyone, and the second, house, second half of the house was added. He was one of the founding fathers of the German community in Bailey's Harbor and helped to clear land for the town cemetery. For his work, he was given seven plots, one for each member of the family, which included five daughters. Daughter Kate Faust was working in a millinery shop in Chicago when she married Frank Candioto in 1914. They moved to the farm when Frank retired in 1942, and he raised cucumbers to sell to a pickle factory. According to family legend, he also introduced zucchini to Door County. Kate, the mother of Betty Candy Odo Thielen Osborne, told the story of making the all-day trip to Sturgeon Bay by horse and buggy. When a train bore down on them as they were crossing the railroad bridge, the horse ran for dear life and saved them all. In the early 1930s, the family walked to Schramm's Hall on Sundays to watch a movie, then back to Wasserbach's for Three Graces. Do you know what Three Graces was? An ice cream sundae. Betty's husband, Jack Thielen, was in the army in Germany during World War II. When he landed in New York on leave, Charlie Collins tracked Betty down at a farm on the Polish road. 
what was the Polish road? What is it now? Double E. He drove her to town to take the call. Alice Hickey, the phone operator, kept the line open until Betty got there. One night, Betty and Jack heard a loud noise coming from town, and they drove in to see what was going on. They found that the war was over. They went into Patter's Bar to celebrate with other Bailey's Harborites. The sheriff called Patter's and told him it was time to lock up. The owner said, sure, no problem. So he locked the bar with all the celebrants inside, and they, par <laughs> <laughs> they partied all night. Carol Ann Thielen Smith wrote, some say that as we go through life, we have lessons to learn. For instance, it was a known fact among family and friends that in our farmhouse, one could not make toast and flush the toilet at the same time. <laughs> Otherwise, a trip to the cellar to replace a fuse was in order. The last weekend in May 1999, we learned several things. Mother Nature is a powerful thing. Lightning blew up one of our farmhouse's most prized and talked about possessions, the toilet. After that day, we had the dubious distinction of being our insurance adjuster's first toilet blow up. <laughs> On that fateful night, simultaneous lightning and thunder hovered directly over the farmhouse. Sitting on our porcelain throne, I had a little voice in my head say, hurry up. <laughs> Five minutes later, we took a direct hit, which traveled from a tree root to our holding tank, up the drain pipe, to the bolts that fastened the toilet to the floor, blowing up the base of the toilet and the floor. This is the Faust County Ona Homestead in 1996. When Carol Schmidt, the current resident, remodeled it, she found newspaper insulation dated from 1882 to 1888, and she stripped 25 pounds of paint from the walls of one bedroom. Mary Kay Thielen McGrady wrote, do you know why there's no longer a wooden fence around the farm? Because we were freezing in, in 1969. We used every available piece of wood on the property that wasn't growing. I was shocked the barn even stood up as long as it did because Warren sawed off every piece of wood that held it up. <laughs> Most of the memories people shared with me for the book were happy, but some were heart-wrenching. Jim Finley, the first person I interviewed for the book when he was 90 years old, remembered waiting years until he could afford to marry his sweetheart, Adelaide Collins. This is Addie with her parents, Mr. and Miss Hugh Collins, about 1920. Jim lost Addie just under a year after their wedding, within days of the birth of their daughter, Mary Ellen, who grew up to marry Will Anschutz. Jim, if you remember, was a, a rough-speaking old fella. But he asked me to turn off the tape recorder when he told me about Addie's death. He told me the exact hour and minute and day she died. He said, I always felt guilty because I wasn't able to get her to a good doctor. Decades after losing the, losing the love of his life, he whispered, I've never gotten over that. I was giving this talk some time ago, and an acquaintance of his said, well, he certainly wasn't for lack of trying. He was married four more times. <laughs> <laughs> I liked old Jim. In 2004, my husband Howard and I spent many hours in the county recorder's office tracing the ownership of our property. It was an intriguing search, and I'd recommend it to anyone who's interested in learning who inhabited this place before we did. We discovered we're the 17th owners of part of government lots 1 and 2, section 31, township 30 north, range 28 east. James Black, the first owner, received a land grant in 1856 to purchase 75 acres for just over 70 cents an acre. He bought 75 acres for $52.88. Four years later, Jarvis Wright acquired the property for back taxes of $14.29. And 13 months later, he acquired it again for back taxes of $14.92. There's either a major bookkeeping error or a very interesting story there. <laughs> We've owned our little corner of Kangaroo Lake for exactly 20 years today. But five generations of our family, from a two-week-old great-grandson to uncles, aunts, and cousins in their late 80s, have enjoyed it. I wrote the lake's history in my office, which began life as a boathouse. A neighbor who's been on the lake since the 1930s told us that Anna and Charles Cruisinger who owned the house from 1949 to 1957, used the boathouse as a bait shop. 
They said at 6.30 every morning, neighbors could hear Anna singing over the sound of her boat motor as she putted down to the south end of the lake to catch minnows to sell. We've had as many as 14 house guests at one time. One year, we had visitors every night, overnight guests, every night from mid-May to mid-August. 60 days, 60, 90, 90 days in a row. Uh, it was sometimes hectic, but I never needed to take the advice of our dear late neighbor, Betty Gauger, who said, honey, if you don't have time to wear those sheets, just hang them on the clothesline and hose them down. <laughs> she said, that's what I do. <laughs> oh, she was a sweetheart. Our little house on Kangaroo Lake has given us the opportunity to share with family and friends a world that is in many ways unchanged in the past hundred years, an appreciation for nature and quiet pleasures that will always be a part of them. And that's the reason the license on our old van, which has carried us so often over the 562 miles between our two wor worlds, reads LVDCWI, Love, Door County, Wisconsin. I have just two regrets about the book that occupied so much of my time off and on for 10 years. The first is that Jim Finley, Mary Ann Catherine Collins, and Pat Tischler, who contributed so many of the wonderful old stories, didn't live to see their memories in print. The second regret is that our family missed all the fun of those early years. And that's why the sign on my office door said, I wasn't born here, but I got here as quick as I could. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you have questions, I will attempt to answer them. I may have to look up the answers. And as I said, there are probably lots of you in the audience who know a lot more about uh, the area than I do. I would say if anyone is interested in the book, it's been through three printings, and there is one copy left in the bookstore, as of last Friday, anyway. Uh, you have lots of questions, I'm sure, Patty. That was absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you It so was just much. great. I, I learned so much. Hi. Could you uh, explain what the motivation was to improve the causeway to go to the effort of putting in 5 million board feet of logs? I, I think probably just better transportation. Just to get around? The, yeah, the only way was that before coming? that was that little trail that kind of went across from Maple into Summit Road. Was that county done? Or? I think that was just a natural trail. The, the original causeway, let's see what it says. It's very close to the beginning. How many of you people are here from Kangaroo Lake? Are owners or renters or whatever? Just raise your hands. Quite a few. Quite a few. Quite a few. There's, two the, there's two of the first ones right here, set here. Right here? Okay, okay. Would you like to say a few words? Not really. Not really? <laughs> <laughs> you know it all because you were there, right? We've been here since 1923. 1923, okay. I made my first trip up here 92 years ago. I was three months old. Oh, I had to see Grandma and Grandpa on the farm. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And what side of the lake are you on? East. East side, okay, okay. And? Al Armado. We're 1928, and I think I've been coming here since, well, 1929, that I can tell you for sure. Oh, my gosh. I think a round of applause for these two gentlemen is required. <laughs> I mean, how amazing. And right back here, too, I want to um, just, we have one of the Goss family here, Michael Goss, and it was your grandfather? Great-grandfather. Great-grandfather was? was the start of the Gosses. Okay, and okay. his name was? Uh, Michael. Michael, and you were named after him? I was. Okay. And we, are, we have another Goss on this side, and too. we have another Goss on this yeah. side. Who's the other Goss over there? Right over here. Okay. Is this a brother? Yes. Okay. Here, okay. It looks like a Goss, even. <laughs> and Hi. you are? Richard Goss, my wife, Carol. Your wife, 
White Hi. Carol. Okay, yes. okay. Betty Garger's daughter. Mine's mother's uh, the one that holds down the sheets. That holds down <laughs> the sheets. <laughs> That's my mother. What a great and idea. I, uh, sometimes thinking about doing that. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm sure you get lots of company too. Are you Ron Gogger's sister then? Or? Yes. Okay, I went to school with Ron Gogger. Lynn Edmonds Matkey. Of course. Yes, of course. How fine. Good to see you. That's what's so fun about this. We live right in the middle of Goss Lab, and oh. they still speak to us, too. You know? oh, oh, yes. Good for you. Um, now, I don't know if it was mentioned, Patty, but, you know, all around Kangaroo Lake, when I was growing up, it was kind of known as the Irish Settlement. Yes. And, yes. you know, it was the Goss, the Finley connection. Those were all Irish settlers yeah. that, for some reason, settled on Kangaroo Lake. And I don't know what the connection was. It's probably just like the Polish settlement and the German settled in one area. But Kangaroo Lake was always, you know, known kind of as the Irish settlement. So, you know. Who else from Kangaroo Lake has a story or a family who's been coming up here forever? I know you people have, have stories. So, right back here, Carol Schmidt. Candiota connection. I'll just tell you one story about my grandmother. When they were younger, they wanted to have the causeway in front of our farmhouse on Summit. And they were very, very disappointed oh, that they put it on E instead of on path. Summit. And I can tell you, I thank Friday. the Lord every day. <laughs> that it never went in front of the farmhouse <laughs> because people are fishing there in the crack of dawn. Uh, my family settled here from Germany in 1882 and we did celebrate our 130th year this year. Mm -hmm. And we had that parade in the... We were in the parade. parade. They had seven generations. That's pretty, it's pretty special. Thank you, Carol. Special, right? <laughs> Very good. Anyone else from Kangaroo Lake here that has a story? I know that we talked about um, Tischler. Where's Jumbo? Over here. I didn't realize, Jumbo, that your dad built so many of those houses on Kangaroo Lake. Do you have any stories that you would like to relate that your dad had told you? I'm sure there were a lot, but you probably don't want to relate them. And that family still owns that house. Okay. That's on the east side. That was one of, the, yeah, one of the first homes. That was a long time ago. We remember, too, that, you know, Krieger's on Kangaroo Lake and then the evolution of that from one family to another. And Wasn't that Michelson's a beer bar? Yes, it was. <laughs> and, we who, and we who were so young just happened to go there a few times. I think it was, it was an 18-year-old beer bar. You're absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And we had to walk through the living room to get to the bathroom. I remember that. I still remember that. Um, um, no, Kangaroo Lake has really been special to Billy's Harbor. I mean, a lot of memories there, and especially the fishing and, and going out there. But you who are, you know, long-term families of Kangaroo Lake, I mean, that's amazing for how many years that Patty was telling us about that these families have been coming up here. Patty, what was your connection to coming to Door County and oh, to Kangaroo Lake? You don't have time to listen to okay. Yes, you do. This is a great story. Okay, you don't need to. I've, I've got okay. a mic. I worked with a fellow who was a sailor. This goes back to the uh, late 80s, early 90s. He had a 36-foot sailboat, but he wanted a big boat. And a uh, real estate agent in Detroit was searching for a big boat for him, and she called in October of 1989 and said, I found this wonderful boat. It's in Dry Dock in Ohio. It's part of a bankruptcy settlement it's going to be sold auctioned off in Detroit this weekend so he and his wife zipped to Ohio loved the boat on to Detroit and bought it for sixty five thousand dollars it was a quarter of a million dollar boat they got a big bargain it was a 46 foot sailboat just a gorgeous thing and uh, it was too late in the fall to bring it back and it was going to cost a whole lot to trailer it so the next spring, he and four buddies were going to sail this boat back through the lakes from Ohio on down the uh, Mississippi River to St. Louis. And his wife was not a cook. And you know lots of women say, ah, I don't really cook. 
she really did not cook. They had lived in a new house seven years and the stove had yet to be turned on. <laughs> so I sent a lot of food along with these guys for their journey. And they thought they could get back to St. Louis in 16 days, but they were anchored in Sister Bay the night that terrible storm hit in the spring of 1990 and boats were going away, pulling part of the docks with them. And his boat was not injured, but they were not able to bring it on to St. Louis. They ran out of time. So he and his wife came back many weekends to visit their boat. And in return for all the food I sent with him, he brought me some little presents. And one of them was a book called The Best of Door County. And I have told him that 395 book was the best present I ever got in my life because that was my introduction to Door County. And it listed bed and breakfast and shops and uh, places to eat, interesting things about the county. And we had not planned a vacation yet. Uh, we were both school people and, and Howard was in charge of summer school and was not through till the 1st of August. And I said, why don't we go and see Door County? So I called what sounded like the best place to stay and it was a white gull and I found out, yes indeed, it was a very nice place and way too expensive for us. The next place I called was a French country inn in Ephraim and we came and stayed 13 days and every day we would drive around, drive around all the little back roads and think, oh my gosh, if we could ever have a second home, wouldn't it be wonderful to be here? Never dreaming that it might be possible. Uh, that was in 1990. That was also the very month AFT began in Peninsula Park. And the uh, innkeeper said, you really ought to go see their shows. I hear it's a nice little thing over there. So we did, we saw both of them. And uh, two years later, my mother died and left some money, not enough to live on or get rich, but it was enough for a down payment on a house. And I've been corresponding with the realtor up here all those two years. And uh, we came and he was out of state for his sister's wedding, but he left us a map and little red dots every place he knew that was for sale. And we found the house on Kangaroo Lake. And when he came back, he said, uh, we met him in his office when he got back from the wedding. And we got to the house before he did, but he drove up and he said, ah, she's taking pictures, it's a sale. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it's not fancy, but I absolutely love it. We have had such good times there and so much company. We had friends from St. Louis came by today and we took them for a boat ride. And it's, yes, yes, they're friends from St. Louis here too oh, tonight that I didn't know were in town, although they come every summer. But uh, it's been a great place. And I might also just give a little plug for American Folklore Theater. We have seen every show they've done in 22 years and have volunteered over there for, I, I imagine, 18, probably. Uh, we were not here in the summer of, of 91 because we went to England, but the shows they did that summer, they repeated later on, so we got to see them later. <laughs> well, that's how we got to Door County. Thank you, Patty, so much. If there's right. any, any other questions, if not, we thank you all so much for coming. Uh, if you have any time or any talents that you'd like to share with the Historical Society, we would absolutely appreciate anybody who has technical skills, has pictures they'd like to share with us. We will uh, copy them and return them to you because in many cases they're family heirlooms. But it is giving us a wonderful pictorial history. It's just amazing. Yes, yes how kind and generous people have been with sharing their family photos with artifacts that we've been able to take pictures of and to enjoy and to share with everybody else. Our DVDs are always on sale back there. And again, thank you so much for coming.